Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of gratefulness, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the book of Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray. Now, if you're just joining us, I would encourage you to go back and watch Road to Calvary, Part 1, Road to Calvary, Part 2, Road to Calvary, Part 3, Humility Series, and then join us in the Absolute Surrender Series. This will lay a foundation for you that will make you ready for the truths that you're going to receive in these studies. Now, today we're in chapter 6, which is titled, O Wretched Man That I Am. Our text comes from Romans chapter 7, verse 24, in the first part of verse 25, when it says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You should know the wonderful place that this text has in the wonderful epistle to the Romans. It stands here at the end of the seventh chapter, as the gateway into the eighth chapter. In the first 16 verses of the eighth chapter, the name of the Holy Spirit is found 16 times. You have there the description and promise of the life that a child of God can live in the power of the Holy Spirit. This begins in the second verse when it says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. From that, Paul goes on to speak of the great privileges of the child of God, the one who is to be led by the Spirit of God. The gateway into all this is in the 24th verse of the 7th chapter, which reads, O wretched man that I am. There you have the words of a man who has come to the end of himself. He has in the previous verses described how he had struggled and wrestled in his own power to obey the holy law of God, and yet he had failed and failed miserably. But in answer to his own question, he now finds the true answer and cries out, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. From that, he goes on to speak of what that deliverance is, what it is that he has discovered. I want from these words to describe the path by which a man can be led out of the spirit of bondage into the spirit of liberty. You know how distinctly it is said, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We are continually warned that this is the great danger of the Christian life, to go again into bondage. And I want to describe the path by which a man can get out of bondage into the glorious liberty of the children of God, or rather, I want to describe the man himself. First, these words are the language of a regenerate man. Second, they are the language of an impotent man. Third, they are the language of a wretched man. And fourth, they are the language of a man on the borders of complete liberty. Well, let's look at them one by one. First, the regenerate man. There is much evidence of regeneration from the 14th verse of the chapter on to the 23rd verse. It says, It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That is the language of a regenerate man, a man who knows that his heart and nature have been renewed, and that sin is now a power in him that is not himself. The scripture says, I delight in the law of the Lord after the inward man. That again is the language of a regenerate man. He dares to say when he does evil, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It is of great importance, friends, to understand this. 
in the first two great sections of the epistle, Paul deals with justification and sanctification. In dealing with justification, he lays the foundation of the doctrine in the teaching about sin, not in the singular sin, but in the plural, sins, the actual transgressions. In the second part of the fifth chapter, he begins to deal with sin, not as actual transgression, but as a power, a force within us. Just imagine what a loss it would have been to us if we had not this second half of the seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans. If Paul had admitted in his teaching this vital question of the sinfulness of the believer. We should have missed the question we all want answered as to sin in the believer. What is the answer? The regenerate man is one in whom the will has been renewed and who can truly say, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Well, now let's look at the impotent man. Here is the great mistake made by many Christian people. They think that when there is a renewed will, it is enough. But that is not the case. This regenerate man tells us, I will do what is good, but the power to perform, I find not. How often people tell us that if you set yourself determinedly, you can perform what you will. But this man was as determined as any man can be, and yet he made the confession, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. But you ask yourself, how is it God makes a regenerate man utter such a confession with a right will, with a heart that longs to do good and longs to do its very uttermost to love God? Let us look at this question. What has God given us our will for? Had the angels who fell in their own will the strength to stand? Verily, no. The will of the creature is nothing but an empty vessel in which the power of God is to be made manifest. The creature must seek in God all that it is to be. You have it in the second chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. And you have it here also, that God's work is to work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here is a man who appears to say, God has not worked to do in me. But we are taught that God works both to will and to do. How is the apparent contradiction then to be reconciled? Well, you will find that in this passage. Romans chapter 7, verses 6 through 25. The name of the Holy Spirit does not occur once, nor does the name of Christ occur. The man is wrestling and struggling to fulfill God's law. Instead of the Holy Spirit and of Christ, the law is mentioned nearly 20 times. In this chapter, it shows a believer doing his very best to obey the law of God with his regenerate will. Not only this, but you will find the little words, I, me, and my, occur more than 40 times. It is the regenerate I in its impotence, seeking to obey the law without being filled with the Spirit. This is the experience of almost every saint. After conversion, a man begins to do his best, and he fails. But if we are brought into the full light, we need fail no longer, nor need we fail at all if we have received the Spirit in his fullness at conversion. God allows that failure so that the regenerate man should be taught of his own utter impotence. It is in the course of this struggle that there comes to us this sense of our utter sinfulness. It is God's way of dealing with us. He allows that man to strive to fulfill the law that as he strives and wrestles, he may be brought to say, I am a regenerate child of God, but I am utterly helpless to obey his will, to obey his law. 
See what strong words are used all through the chapter to describe the condition? I am carnal, sold under sin. I see another law in my members bringing me into captivity. And last of all, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This believer who bows here in deep contrition is utterly unable to obey the law of God. Well, this brings us to the wretched man. Not only is the man who makes this confession a regenerate and an impotent man, but he is also a wretched man. He is utterly unhappy and miserable. And what is it that makes him so utterly miserable? He is deeply wretched because he feels he is not obeying his God. He says to himself with brokenness of heart, It is not I that do it, but I am under the awful power of sin, which is holding me down. It is I, and yet not I. Alas, alas, it is myself. So closely am I bound up with it, and so closely is it intertwined with my very nature." Blessed be God when a man learns to say, O wretched man that I am. From the depth of his heart, he should utter these words. Then he is on his way to the eighth chapter of Romans. There are many, however, who make this confession a pillow for sin. They say that if Paul had to confess his weakness and helplessness in this way, what are they that they should try to do better? So the call to holiness is quietly set aside. Would to God that every one of us had learned to say these words in the very spirit in which they are written here. When we hear sin spoken of as the abominable thing that God hates, do not many of us wince before the word? Would that all Christians who go on sinning and sinning, would take this very verse to heart. If you ever utter a sharp word, say, O wretched man that I am. And every time you lose your temper, kneel down and understand that it was never meant by God that this was to be the state in which his child should remain. Would God that we would take this word into our daily life and say it every time we are touched about our own honor, every time we say sharp things, and every time we sin against the Lord God, and against the Lord Jesus Christ in his humility, and in his obedience, and in his self-sacrifice. Would to God you could forget everything else and cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. Why should you say this whenever you commit sin? Because it is when a man is brought to this confession that deliverance is at hand. And remember, it was not only the sense of being impotent and taken captive that made him wretched, but it was above all the sense of sinning against his God. The law was doing its work making sin exceeding sinful in his sight. The thought of continually grieving God became utterly unbearable. It was this that brought forth the piercing cry, O wretched man that I am. As long as we talk and reason about our impotence and our failure and only try to find out what Romans 7 means, it will profit us but little. But when once every sin gives new intensity to the sense of wretchedness and we feel our whole state as one of not only helplessness but actual exceeding sinfulness, we shall be pressed not only to ask who shall deliver us but to cry, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Well, this now brings us to the almost delivered man. The man has tried to obey the beautiful law of God. He has loved it. He has wept over his sin. He has tried to conquer. 
He has tried to overcome fault after fault, but every time he has ended in failure. What did he mean by the body of this death? Did he mean my body when I die? Verily, no. In the eighth chapter, you have the answer to this question in the words, If ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That is the body of death from which he is seeking deliverance. And now he is on the brink of deliverance. In the 23rd verse of the 7th chapter, we have the words, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It is a captive that cries, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is a man who feels himself bound. But look to the contrast in the second verse of the eighth chapter, which says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free, hallelujah, from the law of sin and death. That is the deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord, the liberty to the captive which the Spirit brings. Can you keep captive any longer a man made free by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? But you say, the regenerate man, had not he the spirit of Jesus when he spoke in the sixth chapter? Yes, but he did not know what the Holy Spirit could do for him. God does not work by his spirit as he works by a blind force in nature. He leads his people on as reasonable, intelligent beings. And therefore, when he wants to give us that Holy Spirit whom he has promised, he brings us first to the end of self, to the conviction that though we have been striving to obey the law, we have failed. When we have come to the end of that, then he shows us that in the Holy Spirit, we have the power of obedience the power of victory, and the power of real holiness. God works to will, and he is ready to work to do. But alas, many Christians misunderstand this. They think because they have the will, it is enough, and that now they are able to do. This is not so. The new will is a permanent gift an attribute of the new nature. The power to do is not a permanent gift, but must be each moment received from the Holy Spirit. It is the man who is conscious of his own impotence as a believer who will learn that by the Holy Spirit, he can live a holy life. This man is on the brink of that great deliverance, The way has been prepared for the glorious eighth chapter. I now ask this solemn question to you, friend. Where are you living? Is it with you, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Where every now and then a little experience of the power of the Holy Spirit is evidence? Or is it you that say, I thank God through Jesus Christ? The law of the Spirit has set me free from the law of sin and of death. What the Holy Spirit does is to give the victory. We are told, If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, then ye shall live. It is the Holy Ghost who does this, the third person of the Godhead. He it is who when the heart is open wide to receive him, comes in and reigns there and mortifies the deeds of the body day by day, hour by hour, and moment by moment. I want to bring this to a point. Remember, dear friend, what we need is to come to decision and action. There are in scripture two very different sorts of Christians. The Bible speaks in Romans, Corinthians, 
and Galatians about yielding to the flesh. And that is the life of tens of thousands of believers. All their lack of joy in the Holy Ghost and their lack of the liberty that he gives is just owing to the flesh. The spirit is within them, but the flesh rules their life. To be led by the Spirit of God is what they need. Would God that I could make every child of his realize what it means that the everlasting God has given his dear son, Christ Jesus, to watch over you every day, and that what you have to do is simply trust, and that the work of the Holy Spirit is to enable you every moment to remember Jesus and to trust him. The Spirit has come to keep the link with him unbroken every moment. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. We are so accustomed to think of the Holy Spirit as a luxury for special times or for special ministers and men. But the Holy Spirit is necessary for every believer, every moment of the day. Praise God you have him and that he gives you the full experience of the deliverance that is found in Christ alone as he makes you free from the power of sin. Who of us longs to have the power and the liberty of the Holy Spirit? Oh, brother, sister, bow before God in one final cry of despair and say, Oh, God, must I go on sinning this way forever? Who shall deliver me, O wretched man that I am, from the body of this death? Are you ready to sink before God in that cry and seek the power of Jesus to dwell and work in you? Are you ready to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ? What good does it do that we go to church or attend conventions or that we study our Bibles and pray unless our lives are filled with the Holy Spirit? This is what God wants and nothing else will enable us to live a life of power and peace. You know that when a minister or parent, when a question is asked, an answer is expected. Alas, how many Christians are content with the question put here? O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But they never give the answer. Instead of answering, they are silent. Instead of saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, they are forever repeating the question without the answer. If you want the path to full deliverance of Christ and the liberty of the Spirit, the glorious liberty of the children of God, take it through the seventh chapter of Romans and then say, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be not content to remain ever groaning, but say, I, a wretched man, thank God through Jesus Christ. Even though I do not see it all, I am going to praise God for his deliverance. There is deliverance. There is the liberty of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is joy and in the Holy Ghost. And may you learn this and experience it for yourself. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of chapter six today. And I truly trust that you are learning and being changed by what we are being taught in this study and that you are recognizing, most importantly, the attitude of your heart. And when you see what lies therein, you look unto Jesus and his precious Holy Spirit for the deliverance that he alone can bring. And you find yourself truly saying, I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ by the empowering victory of his Holy Spirit, who is forever working in me and changing me into the image of God he designed me to be. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.